Let's give a warm welcome to Erwin Worm. Yeah. So, aren't you relaxed? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm relaxed after having get, gotten the show up. So pleased to have it up. So I thought that it would be nice to kind of start from the beginning and talk about your beginnings as a sculptor. I know that you've told this story many times, so I'll kind of paraphrase it first, and then you can, you can share your thoughts. Um, or maybe you just tell it. But the grad, you know, grad well, yeah, um, it's normally it's boring. The, these stories are boring, but I think it's interesting because it really um, brought me to the right, uh, into the right way. So in Austria at that time, uh, I wanted to study art, and you had to make an exam, an interest, a public an, an, an entrance exam, entrance exam, right, um, for the art school, and I wanted to become a painter because I was painting during that time as a scholar and as a young man I was painting. This was my big wish, but they didn't accept me in the painting class, they put me in the sculpture class. So, big shock, of course. My whole, I mean, my whole world collapsed. I was thinking about the colors and, uh, you know, all these things, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden they said no. And uh, after a short period of time of, of heavy, heavy doubts and um, desperation, I started to work about the notion of sculpture. So and this I did for a very long time. So first I have to say, it seems as if the professors at the academy knew your work better, perhaps, and they, they, do they maybe recognize something in, your, in the material that probably, you sent yes, yes, that probably. you did not recognize? And so I know, I think that there are a number of art students in the audience, maybe some from Heron, so you have to take this uh, lesson, an example, that if, when you proceed into the world, the art world, don't be discouraged, because here we have the well, great... be discouraged. <laughs> <laughs> The art world is a dragon. Be very discouraged. Oh, we have to. But hold on. <laughs> you have to give them a little bit of hope. Um, so, so my understanding is that um, you started developing these one-minute sculptures out of some practical issues you were trying mm -hmm. to resolve, mm -hmm. like trying to find affordable material. You didn't have much money to buy expensive material, and yeah, as I had no money. Oh, I, I forgot. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I forgot my to... slides. Sorry. Okay. <sighs> I started to um, work with materials other people threw away, with garbage, basically. And at the very beginning, I had with friends, we shared a little studio, uh, 50 square meters and four people. Um, and it was close to um, a company where they make furnitures and uh, work with wood. And there were, was a lot of old wood, not used wood. And, I started to work with this, and then we changed uh, studio to another place where they worked with cans, so I started to work with cans. And then, another change, uh, all of a sudden there was a, there was a thrift store around, and, the, and in the backyard of the studio there were, a l I mean, a big amount of clothes, clothes, trousers, jackets, and so on. And um, as I was always very, very much interested in, uh, as I said, working about the notion of sculpture, from two to three dimension, time, mass, volume, emptiness, heaviness, and all these things. I've realized soon that cloth is in a way the second skin of us and mm. defines form, uh, it's, but itself has no form. Cloth itself has no form. So I started to work with clothes. And from that point on, I started, I re allowed myself, or I, I realized when I work with materials which are close to my surrounding, to the studio, why don't make it the next step and work with materials which are around you all the time, like everyday objects? And this I started in um, 70, ah, 79, yes. And then you started developing your, your one-minute sculpture yeah, idea? Later. Yeah. Do you want to talk about how those started to, to emerge? Yes. To, uh, um, uh, I made many, many tries and, and researches and uh, was interested in, in the moment um, when somebody's standing there, it's an action, and on the other side, it's also a sculpture. So the question was, how long is something when you do something or when you stand quiet, stand still, is this an, is this an, an action or is it in sculpture? And how long is an action? When does it start to be a sculpture? So I was working about these things and um, um, by proceeding with things, I, I started soon 
uh, when, I, when I started to work with, with um, uh, sweaters to make instruction drawings because I would, for example, make a piece with two nails in the wall and then hang a sweater on a certain, uh, with a certain construction which was related to certain um, uh, important artworks of the 20th century, like let's say the Dijon, um, um, uh, how you call it, urinal and other things. Fountain. Um, fountain, fountain, yes, thanks. So um, I found it very important to uh, transfer this pullover or the sweater and after the show, people could take it down and wear it again. So it was just, um, the pullover was just an art piece for a very short period of time, for one month. And then later on, it could be worn again, worn again for, uh, for, the, for the people. And this period of time where the existence of the artwork became shorter and shorter. So there was the beginning and the end was included. And this I found very exciting. It fitted so much to our time, you know, our short living time. I found this um, wonderful. Did, did you ever try to use actual tangible materials to first sculpt when you were in Ingrat? Were you able, to, were you, did you try to sculpt out of wood and metal? I made like a classical, I made a classical. So uh, you had the traditional sculpture. training yes. and, and yeah. then you were just trying to kind of shed away all the kind of traditions yes. of, of mm -hmm. sculptures. And Later on I came back to these things. Right, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that mm -hmm. in a few minutes. So how did you um, start to actually form what the one minute sculptures that, are, that exist today. So for the public here who are not yet familiar, um, what Erwin does is um, provide, uh, oops, sorry. You can call it performative sculptures. Performative sculptures. Mm -hmm. So he provides drawings and then props and everyday materials and then he asks you, the viewer, to perform these living sculptures um, for you know, a duration of time potentially 60 seconds, but I've learned recently that it doesn't actually have to be. It's just a synonym for short right. one minute. I called them one. I was looking for a brand name because <laughs> I wanted, yes, because I wanted, you know, in the art world you need things like this, very important. And um, I found one minute is a good, it's a synonym for short. It can be 10 seconds or two minutes. It doesn't count, it doesn't matter. And then these works became truly popular. Were you surprised by the response? Very much. Mm -hmm. In what ways did you feel that it had kind of entered in well, some ways um, popular culture or design or fashion. The first show when I when I made with with um, the first show when I named uh, the work one minute sculptures was in Germany in Bremen and I was invited to go there and ship things but I didn't ship things I, I just went there I think ten days in advance and started to work with the materials I found at this Kunstverein at this institution. So there, was, there were the pens and the bottles and the chairs and everything from the institution plus the people who worked there. And I tried to make these sets and performances with these people. I tried everything out myself first, and then I asked them to do it. And then we made a little catalog. And before my catalogs, I mean, they didn't sell well. This, we, we sold, I don't know, we printed a thousand copies, but we sold, let's say, seven. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it, this is happening mostly to art, art catalogs. But with this catalog, it was sold out in two weeks. Really? And then That's we fantastic. made another copy, and then we made another copy, and then all of a sudden I, people told me, do you know that many people all of a sudden are so much interested and use your work also as uh, inspiration, like graphic designers, fashion photographers, and um, artists also. And all of a sudden, this was very surprising, there was a big, there was a big thing going on. And then, and then later we had, um, do I have this next? Uh, let me go back. Red Hot Chili yeah, Pepper. One day, uh, Mark Romanek called of the Red Hot Chili Pepper, and then we made this video together. And um, you know, knowing that MTV was always stealing ideas from artists, <laughs> many directors stole ideas, and they were never credited. And I thought, okay, if I accept this, and of course it was a big chance, I mean, it was a fantastic chance. I said, but I would like to be credited, and they did it. And I think it was I was the first artist who got credited on MTV. So they played this video, and always in the back was, was written, uh, inspired by the work of Erwin Wurm. So now he has permission. This, this was just unbelievable. And now he has permission to show it whenever. So we actually have it on view for all of you to see it up in the yeah. Contemporary Gallery. So it's kind of fun to have a music video up in And then other mu and, and music, uh, bands came and pop groups came, but I said no, because I think, I mean, first it's a very good band, and then to copy this and to go on with this was, uh, was not my, my target. Uh, many other labels came, like fashion labels came, or, or 
cars company, car companies came and they asked me to do these things. Um, and as I, as I thought, um, the media, the magazines and mass media and, and TV is the contemporary place for art, for public art. I agreed to many of these projects, so I made all, I made all these pictures for Vogue and for, I don't know, all these big magazines for a, 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 a period of time, and then I stopped it again. Did you ever feel a kind of unease that you were merging yeah, kind of leave, spheres, yeah, popular yeah, versus... I also tried, because at that time nobody made, uh, nobody, uh, no artist made advertisement, so I was the first to try to accept something. I failed totally because they didn't like it and they, they never used it. I used it later for shows, but after that, many artists did this. I mean, many artists make advertisement for whatever, Louis Vuitton and right, so on and right. so on. And then um, one day, uh, this big brand, Hermès, came to me, and you know, Hermès is this, I don't know if you know this, it's a French brand, they have insane prices. Hermès, so Hermès. Hermès, yes, so you can buy a leather jacket there with a hoodie for 70,000 euro. I mean, he's go who is going to wear this? Russians <laughs> and Chinese. <laughs> so I found this very interesting and I was working about this also. Might you share a little bit about the earlier kind of versions of the one minute sculpture um, where you would allow another participatory action where you would invite people to take photographs or Polaroids of the one minute sculptures you enacted and then they would, he would allow you to send them to you? Yes, because I, I had this um, dream of, in a way, democratic art. Um, so I um, invented in instruction drawings. And uh, when we had, like here, uh, when I made a show, I made instruction drawings on a platform, on a pedestal, uh, with uh, different objects. And the people were invited, the public was invited to realize the sculpture after my instruction. And I was always very strict with this. If, some, if someone did something else, then it was something else. It was not a, a, a piece of mine. And then we invited people to make um, pictures, at that time, Polaroid. And um, they could keep it, they could take it as, with them at home, or they could later send it to me by post. And uh, if they would add 100 euro or 100 dollar, I would sign it and send it back. So. I would and then that became a work of art in yes, its own, right? I was interested, you know, um, to work about authorship. So I, I in, in a way, invited them to follow my instruction. Then they did it, and then I, um, um, how do you call it? Uh, I signed it and then made it. Uh, Autographed made, it, or yeah, yeah. And then made it um, a work of mine. So it, this was an interesting uh, aspect. How long did you do that for, and how many do you think you signed over that period? Well, um, not many people. <laughs> Not many people? I must say, well, though. Let's say 100 altogether. 100? Well, Erwin, I have to say, I saw a new Facebook friend of mine who I think is here tonight. He posted his Polaroid that you signed. Oh, yeah? So we'll make sure you meet. It? I'm assuming. <laughs> is Christopher West here? Maybe he, I know, I saw him post this, so I'm assuming that was his, so we'll yeah. try and find him. He must have paid for it if that I was thought, the only way. I thought it was just a great business idea, it was not. <laughs> so. But also, I wanted to quickly go back to show the audience how you also made a different kind of branch of the project, which is also to document them, and yeah. then these became your own photographs. What's important, it's not only, you know, humor is an important part, but it's not about fun. So humor is something, humor is a tool to seduce people, to bring them closer. Because I believe strongly that um, um, humor enlightens us in a way. It makes us, if it's not stupid humor, if it's smart humor, it could make us levitate. I grew up in a time when art in the 70s, 60s, 70s was very heavy, uh, full with pathos. And everybody, every artist was, or, or many artists were speaking about the big questions in life in a very heavy way. And this, I found, always makes people small and tiny. And um, so I was interested in the other way. That's the reason why I developed humor, certain humor. Sometimes it's cynicism, sometimes it's mean, but uh, it's never a laughter. I'm not interested in right. the joke. Well, it's a way to, my understanding is to draw, draw you in and a kind of vehicle to access your work. Yes, is that what it is? And, and all these things are related in a way to philosophy and psychology and all these things. Because when I, when I, when I realized first, as I, as I said, I was working with the employees of this Kunstverein and they were the models. And then later on I realized it would be good to go out to the public when I made these um, um, 
um, pictures works for magazines and uh, TV and so on. So when I <coughs> when I went to um, make another show, let's say in France, so the museum or the gallery would make an, a newspaper advertisement and print an image and say an artist is coming in town, he wants to do this and that and he needs models. And many people called at that time, I mean they didn't get paid, and, uh, but there was something what's, what I found coincidentally, there was an, an, a, an, a strong interest in people to perform, to produce themselves in a weird way and uh, this was, I mean, it was incredible and all of a sudden psychology was very much involved. And I think just to kind of put it on the, the visitor level of the experience of it is in the weird way is what you're saying is that I think all of you will find when you hopefully enact these one minute sculptures, actually I'm requiring all of you to do, try it once. <laughs> um, I'm gonna track you all down. That there, there are some sculptures that are some easier to do and some are more challenging and my sense is that a lot of it is to try and get to those embarrassing moments that we humans are not perfect, right? We have frailty and that things fail and... I, I, I like them the most when they are in a way um, um, produce self-reflection self um, because sometimes they have titles like Think About Montaigne hold your breath and think about Montaigne. And Montaigne, for example, was a French philosopher from a uh, Renaissance philosopher. And he was um, writing about the world, but just writing about himself. And this is also what um, philosophers, in a way, quite often do, and artists also. Uh, for that reason, also, I called one of my shows The Artist Who Swallowed the World. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's, let's skip ahead a little bit and just... So these are other works. This is an Ephraimson Pavilion. This one is upstairs in the contemporary galleries, and you already saw this. And then I wanted to um, touch briefly upon um, these works, and I see that people are responding with enjoyment. Um, I think it's interesting how your one minute sculptures um, are completely challenging what sculpture can be, but is still using the human form, which from the beginning of antiquity or even back to the caveman in Lascaux, draw, in the caveman times with Lascaux drawings in France, you have the depiction of the body. And so that is always the, the preeminent form that we are always returning to and still to this day with a lot of uh, figurative painters and that um, you're still returning to the human form in an abstract way with your wonderful sausage sculptures and so um, what Erwin and, Erwin and I discussed was how to make the connections to the past, and that's something that we can do so beautifully here at an institution um, that celebrates the past um, to the present. And so here, I love what you've done with this installation here, and if you might want to talk a bit about these more static sculptures and your continuation um, I, of the body. I, I, from the very beginning, I had this, uh, I, was always, I always tried to make a system in a way, because um, I've realized quick, as an artist, you don't, it's not enough to have one good idea. You need many good ideas over the years. And uh, for that reason, I started to create a system, like I made, I made a wide basis, so I started to work on photography and performance, and um, ephemeral sculptures, in a way, very ephem ephemeral, ephemeral sculptures, yeah. with dust sculptures I did, and so on. Then I, made, I was working on drawings, real 3D sculptures, uh, move, uh, films and what else and performances so it was a big variety and but I always was working more or less uh, how do you call it at the same time on, on all these different in all these different areas but for some for some I don't know different reasons the public was focusing for a, a period of time only on the one minute sculptures and then the focus the fat car and the fat houses this fat series by the way, the Fat Series is related also to the sausages. And Fat Series I made because um, I was really much, uh, I tried to combine social issues and sculptural notion. And um, when you, uh, I've realized when I, when I make a piece with clay, when you model something with clay, you add volume or you take volume away. And when you gain weight or lose weight, you also add volume. And take volume away. So you could say gaining or losing weight is a sculptural work. Mm. <laughs> and this brought me immediately to the social issue because as we all know, it's a big problem. Obesity is mostly related to 
people with lower income <coughs> and or lower uh, consciousness about, about this, so it's a worldwide problem. So all of a sudden the interest in the notion of sculpture um, conquered into different fields and this I found very exciting. And here the sausage is, I mean it's a middle European uh, icon. It's uh, when you eat too many fast sausages, you look like many <laughs> people's look. And so it's addressing, again, obesity, heaviness, not careful, um, um, not careness with, uh, with your own body. And um, I forgot now what I wanted to say. No, it's but great you, what you're you, saying. You wrote a very good text about this in the, in the, um, the social uh, uh, David did. The abstract. And then I edited it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he wanted a copy. Did. Yeah. Now, because there are all these, all these pieces are called abstract sculptures, um, because it's not about the fact that there is a sausage. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to um, uh, work with food, but to transfer it in a way into an abstract form and to use this form to create something else. It sounds, it's a bit difficult, uh, uh, complicated. So I made not only bodies and heads, I also made abstract forms like towers, and I call them this, um, the Tower of the Socialist International. And who wrote this, this text? You? Uh, that one? Because this was very good. David, it and then I edited it. <laughs> I did some revisions Again, on that it, one. It relates to this, the Soviet Union, and uh, um, I was always very critical with socialism, and. Uh, it's a longer story, but you wrote it very good. Well, that's why I hired him. Okay, <laughs> so just a few more shots, and then I have a few more questions, and then I thought I'd open up to the audiences, and then we'll go traipse to the Ephraimson Family Entrance Pavilion. Here's another work that you'll get a sense. I don't think we need to talk about this, but uh, this is also installed right now in our historical, in our European galleries. Um, and then also to honor our Clues uh, courtyard, where we've also installed a one-minute sculpture there to, um, as I've been saying all along, is to really remind all of you that all art was once contemporary. And so to kind of bridge the gap yeah. between the past and the present. And it's amazing, no? It is, right? Yeah. Uh, and a video that we also have um, on view upstairs. And just to give you uh, a taste of a few other works that Irwin has made, um, here's an extraordinary uh, work that he showed at the Venice Biennale. If it's actually my parents' house, <laughs> and it's 20 meters long, and the normal house is nine, but nine or 10 meters wide, and normal height like eight or nine meters high. But I squeezed it towards one meter, so it's long and height, it, the height, the length and the height is original. But I squeezed it. But I squeezed also the rooms, and I squeezed also the furniture. So when you, when you went into this house first, you would all, could only get into this house when you would be skinny. <laughs> and then you saw all these furnaces and immediately when you walked in, it was about claustrophobia. And it was about a certain time. The house was built in the 70s, late, late 60s better. And at that time, Austria was still a very had a restrict uh, society. And uh, it's about this. Um, and then I was hoping to show one of your cars to line up with our great spring show coming up, the Y'all Must Come See Dream Cars, but we couldn't get this on loan because it was being lent somewhere else, or one of the works. So I just this, wanted to give you a- This is in the collection of- um, But a related Adams work, here. yeah. There was yeah. one being lent to oh, another- This is, an, it, this is um, um, it was a very complicated piece. It, it looks like nothing because it's, it's a car, just a little bit like this. Like from the comic strips, when you drive fast, then all of a sudden it's like this. <laughs> but we had to demount this car totally, totally, and reconstruct it totally. It was really, we had to make the glasses and the, and the mirrors and everything, everything, everything. And the car is, it's a French car, it's important because this work is related to Gilles Deleuze. Gilles Deleuze is a very, is a French philosopher, a deconstructivist. And he was writing very much, uh, very often about uh, movie. M he wrote a book about film theory. And as I am very much influenced by film, comic strip, and science fiction, so I, how do you call it? I addressed this, no, how you, I dedicated this uh, work to Schiller Lewis. Oh, very nice. And in the nine, and the, um, <coughs> 1991, Schiller Lewis wrote this book, and the car is made 1991. So oh. Secret message. <laughs> Thanks for decoding that for us. 
So I, just, I wanted to close our conversation before we allow maybe just maybe one or two questions in the audience. Um, I thought that this is, since this is my first conversation with a visiting artist, I was thinking about this uh, conversation we we're going to have today, and I couldn't help but think about, I'm sorry I'm bringing it back to popular culture, but I was thinking about Inside the Actor's Studio with James Lipton, which some of you have seen, and his obsessive cards, which I have too. And um, I thought, wouldn't it be fun from now on, whenever we have great artists come to visit, that I would ask the same question the way James Lipton does on Insider's Actor Studio, which is a nod to the French TV personality Bernard, Bernard Pivot. And so I thought, OK, I'm going to pick three, because um, three sounds really good. But then I was trying to narrow it down, and I couldn't. So I'm going to ask four, which I don't really like. So I, like can, it, I can select. I can kick one question out, right? Well, maybe. I don't know. But I decided I would have four to represent the four seasons. Like in Asian tradition, you don't pick an even number. It's kind of bad luck. So I'm picking four for the, OK, so you want to pick? OK, that's good. That's good. You're going to set this. You're going to set. I'm going to ask you four questions, and you'll answer three. But then you might get to the fourth, and you won't answer it. So. I don't know how that's going to work. But let's just. Well, why don't you read them all together? OK. And I can select. OK, these are my four questions that I'm hoping I'll ask other artists to come, and then we can maybe make something cool out of it um, later on a video or books. OK. Do you have any specific memories of when you first realized you wanted to become an artist? For example, was there a turning point in your life when you made this decision? Mm -hmm. Number two, what has been the most important book or essay? to influence and shape your thinking about your art, and why, mm -hmm. secondary to the second question. Third question, what do you believe is the role of art in culture and society today? And lastly, do you have any advice for artists just starting out? I might, we were, you, didn't, you weren't very. Yes, this I answered already. <laughs> I know, you weren't very encouraged. Hold on. <laughs> OK. so. Do you want me to repeat them? OK. I, what was the first Specific thing? memories of when you first realized you wanted to become an artist. For example, was there, was there a, turning point in your, a turning point in your life when you realized? Smashing doors. Because when I, when I told my father I would like to become an, an artist, he was a policeman. They were smashing to doors. OK. Smashing doors. So lack of approval of your job choice. Mm -hmm. Lack of uh, security and fin mm -hmm. financial security. OK. Um, most important book or essay to influence or shape your... Walter Benjamin, the <coughs> das Kunstwerk <coughs> im Zeitalter seiner technischen Reproduzier Reproduzierbarkeit. The work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. Yeah. I loved it at that time, and now I think it's really shit. You loved it then? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Why do you think it's shit now? It's totally shit because, I mean, look, look around. There is, it's just stupid. He, he forgot about photography. It's idiotic, really. He just thought about painting and sculpture. And not even sculpture, because I mean, look, since, since um, Roman times, they, they made additions, they cast it bronze. So they could make 20 pieces of one cast. OK, good. So. OK, then the last one. <laughs> it's a big question. What, is, what do you believe is the role of art in, in today's culture and society? Little. Little? Unfortunately, very little. It can, it's, you know, in, in, in the 70s, everybody dreamed about Art can change society, and uh, I don't believe so. At the moment, surely not. It can change value, and you can earn a lot of money with this, and you can, you know, it's a gambling now. It's like, it's like stock market, market gambling. That's horrible. That's a horrible part, but I don't believe there's much change. It can, it can change a person, as it did with me. It opened, my, it opened minds, yes. eyes and minds, and uh, when well, maybe I lived, it's more when personal. I, when thing. I lived in this narrow world and I, I, I discovered art for me and literature, all of a sudden I was able to open doors into undiscovered lands, and this was fantastic. So maybe that art is more kind of a personal, the personal connection. So when people come to museums and have their own personal yeah. responses, and maybe, yeah. Mm. Good. Thank you for answering those three questions. So now we will allow we are. We're running a little bit behind, but I think this is quite interesting. I think many of you are enjoying it. Anyone want to ask a question or two? Please raise your hand. Only nice questions. Uh, <laughs> no questions? He's answered everything? I see one in the back there. Stand up and speak loudly. I don't know if we have a mic here, so. I'll speak loudly. Oh, good. Oh, you speak loudly. <laughs> so I, I, it's very temporary. Your work, all art is temporary, obviously. Yours is more so. Of at least at least a section of, of 
your work. I wonder how um, uh, you feel about how everything is becoming more and more temporary in our society. Is that, a, is that, is that okay? Or is that, is that something we need to avoid? Or what's your take on that? No, I was always very critical with this aspect when you know, we all threw things away, nobody repairs things anymore, so they're short living and we waste materials and time and, and many things. But on the other side, these short living sculptures fitted to me very well because I'm a nervous person. I have to make things quick and fast. I like, I like to do things like this. And this helped a lot. And also with my big sculptures, the, I, I, because I believe in strong images, an image represents and projects many, many things, but the way to this image is sometimes long now. But for this, I have assistants who help me. But I, I strongly believe that I invented, for me, this, this short period of time works because I'm a nervous person and I need to have it done quick. Any others? Oh, there's one back there. Yes, you. I switched, but I gave, but I gave up photography. I don't do photography anymore at the moment. Maybe it comes back. Because I thought I made many pictures, maybe too many, mm. and I, repeat, I started to repeat myself. And this, uh, I became very suspicious. Because you know the art market, the galleries, when something sells good and goes good, they always come, I know, come on, let's do the next show and go on with this work, it's great. But this is a trap. It's it dilutes a, it's a true it. Trap. Dilutes it, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. The, the meaning it, of it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and then you repeat it. You, re, you repeat a piece another time and another time. And you, as an artist, you feel very quick. It's not so exciting anymore. And the public is not stupid. They see it also immediately. So I thought it's better to be careful and uh, go on with and proceed with other ideas. One last question out there. Is there one? Oh, yes, right there. <laughs> good question. That's a good question, yes. I mean, you know how our world at the moment goes totally towards money. Uh, I mean, look at the most discussed artists are people like Jeff Koons and, and Damien Hirst because of their prices. Because all of a sudden, and also the normal public, or people who are not interested in art at all, all of a sudden think about art because they think at insane prices. I mean, you have to pay, you have to pay for a, a painting, let's say, for Gerhard Richter, up to 30 or, or 60 or 70 or whatever, 100 million, uh, um, 70 million or 100 million or two million. It's, it's unbelievable. And it's also uh, vulgar in a way. Yes. Because it takes so much out of the arts. It's, it's re it reduces it to um, monetary, um, how do you call this money? Uh, how do you call this? Um, it reduces it totally. And art is so much more, I think. So much more what it can offer. And, and, and this is why art became a gambling uh, uh, tool. And uh, people have realized, or many people realized, oh, if I buy a, a, a nice piece of art and I wait some years, then like I the can stock sell market. it for, let's say, the double or the triple or a tenth for a tenth. And, <coughs> and very often, um, um, I forgot what I wanted to say now, sorry. That's okay, that's okay. But speaking of on that downer it's note about the art, the art market, we are now going to provide you something that's completely the opposite, right? We're gonna do the performance in the Ephraimson Pavilion, um, um, which is and something that- also, And I would also in, uh, like to invite the audience to participate and um, go on with the performance. I and this is something. With this. And this is something that can't be sold on the art market or the auction. So it's a true, I think, a true celebration of what art can be. It's going to last just this evening, but we are going to document it and then show it upstairs on a loop with the red hot chili peppers. So, um, so we're going to applaud Irwin, and then I want you all to go out to Ephraimson and join us. 
the performance is called Carry the Curator. It's to say thank you to the curator. Now you have to, really the time and the, uh, the, 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 the possibility to thank the curator. I think it's great, no? You can, I, I, I also would like, wanted to do it with the museum director because it's also important, but we said it's better. He is too heavy, so we choose her. <laughs> Who is the next? Not too many, please. Please. You know, there are different ways to carry people, so you can try them out. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Next one. Only ladies? Thank you very much. This was great. I'm ticklish. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Who hasn't? <laughs> That's it? No more? That's it? Wait a minute. Great. Oh my god. Very good, very good. Now they Thank you very much. Oh, one more. Oh, yes. one more. oh my God. <laughs> That's an invention. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Erwin. That was, that exceeded my expectations. I didn't know. People are so creative. Fantastic. This is great. Thank you so much. This is so thrilling. And again, thanks so much, Erwin Worm. Let's give him a round of applause. And thanks again for coming and have fun enacting these one minute sculptures. And see you soon.